Gypsy jazz is as hot today as it was in its heyday. Across the globe, interested parties convene at festivals to hear the latest advances in that unique gypsy vibe. Django Fest Northwest in Langley, Washington, near Seattle, and the Django Reinhardt Jazz Festival in Libertis, Belgium, the late great guitarist's hometown, are merely two of many such events. To outsiders, the Django fixation may seem cult-like, and the fact that, unlike jazz's other subgenres, the gypsy sound is the same as when Django first recorded it seems to support the charge of idolatry. But gypsy jazz is more than the impressive legacy of its founder. Nearly a century's worth of innovators, experts, and emulators now rule gypsy jazz from the bottom up. But how did gypsy jazz survive a century that altered or splintered every other musical genre in its path? The profound blend of multicultural stylings and the apparently universal will to spice tunes up with a little swung rhythm are the greatest preservatives of gypsy jazz's charm. Like many other memorable musical innovations, gypsy jazz began at a cultural intersection. One seminal starting point was the birth of modern jazz guitar playing. Gypsy jazz guitar technique owes a tremendous debt to a great Philadelphian, guitarist Eddie Lang, often called the father of jazz guitar. Lang's chord playing was so sophisticated and agile that he could carry fuller melodies than guitarists before him and with less accompaniment. Lang's duets with Joe Venuti, an early master of jazz violin, influenced Django in his collaboration with Stefan Grappelli, also a jazz violin master. Django learned Lang's sophisticated chord playing style but resisted its American flavor. Steeped in gypsy and continental European musical tradition from birth, Django adapted Lang's advancements for his own purposes and audience. The two most notable of these adaptations give gypsy jazz its unmistakable vibe. The first is the emphatic picking style called Le Pomp, or The Pump in English. The Pump is an up-down stroke that guitarists in European waltz bands use to anchor a number's beat. Django used it to emphasize swung rhythms and bass lines. The power of the pump also eliminated the need for percussion instruments. Consequently, unlike many other jazz genres, the gypsy jazz outfits perform without drum kits. Django's second adaptation of Lang's guitar style was to play chords in arpeggio, meaning one note at a time, not to mention at ridiculously fast speeds. Guitarists after Django have played their leads likewise for nearly a century and show no signs of slowing down. These innovations persist in the form of gypsy jazz because they evoke a bright and exciting sensation that speaks for multiculturalism, excellent musicianship, and hot times. So what was happening? Jazz was getting big first out of New Orleans, you know, and it was moving to other cities, Kansas City, Chicago. But it was, it was horn-based music. The only string instruments they would have would be a banjo. And this is coming out of New Orleans. The first time you ever heard anything with a violin, and, I mean, there were, I'm sure, people playing violin in New Orleans, but the first time it, it ever got big and recorded was in the late 20s out of Philadelphia, uh, Joe Venuti and Eddie Lang. So Django and Grappelli and people like that were listening to Lang and Venuti, and they sort of Europeanized it. Um, the big difference I hear is the, the gypsy stuff is European, and European uh, music and folk music seems to be a lot more minor, in minor keys, than the American stuff. And, and so they sort of merged the two. And, and, uh, and so it, it got thrown back at the Americans being Europeanized. And, 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 and to the American audience that, that heard, first heard it, it really sounded cool. Even though Lang and Venuti were already doing that, like 10 years before. 